This generation of weather enthusiasts remembers April 27, 2011 as the day that Birmingham in Tuscaloosa, Alabama got decimated to an unimaginable degree by an EF4 tornado. However, at least for the city of Birmingham, this was nowhere near the first time. 1932, 1956, and 1977 saw significant violent tornadoes hitting the north side of the city. And then in 1998, it happened again. Today, we are going to look at this often forgotten monster tornado, the outbreak that birthed it, and the effects that it had on the area leading up to April 27th. The 1998 tornado season was a wild one, from the deadliest tornado outbreak in Florida state history in February to back back-to-back -back mid Atlantic tornado outbreaks in late May and early June, statistical anomalies just seemed to be the norm that year. But one thing you can always count on is Dixie Alley getting hot in March and April, Dixie Alley being a corridor of tornadic activity from Texarkana, Arkansas to Atlanta, Georgia. In the early spring months, the very warm, moist air needed to fuel thunderstorms sits right over Alabama, Mississippi, and Louisiana, and when a mid-latitude cyclone swings down across the region, the ingredients for a tornado outbreak fall into place. And that's exactly the case the week of April 6th. On the 6th, an area of low pressure aloft was sitting over Colorado, and throughout the next 48 hours, it moved to the northeast. Below the jet stream, a surface low developed and underwent cyclogenesis, meaning it developed a cold front stretching to the southwest and a warm front stretching to the east, gaining in speed and intensity as it moved to the east. As it moved, it caused two smaller tornado outbreaks on the 6th and the 7th, primarily in Illinois and Missouri, the strongest tornadoes both being F2s. But as the warm front pushed further east past Dixie Alley on the 8th, it looked like there could be a major tornado outbreak. Tremendous wind shear was present. The winds at the surface were blowing strong out of the south, bringing in a ton of moisture from the Gulf. The temperature and dew point in Birmingham at 7 a.m. were both 65 degrees, causing some rather dense morning fog. High up in the atmosphere, winds were moving at a blazing 120 knots out of the southwest, offering a lot of wind shear. Right in the middle sat this pocket of dry air that was keeping that moist air at the surface. So in order for that surface air to rise into thunderstorms, we would need some daytime heating from clear skies, as well as some other type of disturbance to poke holes in that dry air to let that surface air explode into a thunderstorm, and that disturbance is a shortwave trough, which is this kink in the flow of the jet stream. Moving from western Texas quickly across Dixie Alley, it provided the disturbance needed to initiate convection, or the rising of moist air from the surface. So how unstable was it? Well, let's say you have this plastic ball filled with air, and this fish tank filled with water is the atmosphere. This ball of air floats, and if you try to push it down into the water, it violently shoots upwards towards the surface. The further down we push this ball, the more potential energy it has, the more violently and quickly it will rise to the top. Now imagine the bottom of the fish tank as the surface of the Earth, and just above our little pocket of air, there is a denser layer of air keeping that ball from rising. If the ball can get past this layer of dense air, it will rise violently and freely through the drier air above it to the top of the atmosphere to form into a thunderstorm. The available potential energy that this air parcel contains is based on how cool, dry, and thick the atmosphere above it is. And that potential energy is called CAPE. The larger the value, the more violently our air parcel will rise, and usually the more violent the storm. Cape values on the evening of the 8th were near 2400 joules per kilogram, which is a lot of energy for a thunderstorm. With all these variables in place, the Storm Prediction Center upgraded their moderate risk to a high risk for Alabama, Mississippi, and western Georgia in the morning on the 8th. A very important aspect of this particular tornado outbreak is boundaries, and I'm not talking about, oh, it's 71 in Topeka and 49 in Salina because there's a giant cold front in the middle. That's a very intense boundary. I'm talking about very subtle boundaries of just a few degrees in temperature or dew point. These matter a lot in tornado outbreaks, and we'll soon see why. Throughout the night and into the morning hours of the 8th, a second surface low had formed over eastern Texas and began pushing eastward towards Alabama. The clashing air masses produced Produced a bunch of different boundaries and gradients centered around the northern half of Alabama. First was the dew point. Warm air was surging northward from the Gulf of Mexico, 
but it slowed down around Birmingham, causing a clear boundary and tight gradient in the northern half of Alabama. Throughout the morning, severe showers and thunderstorms were moving across the southern half of Alabama and Mississippi. But the northern half remained dry, with only a few alto cumulus dotting the sky. This allowed the sun to heat the ground, causing warmer surface temperatures in northern Alabama. These storms to the south released cold air, because that's what storms do, which created an outflow boundary that moved north slowly throughout the afternoon at around 20 knots. If you watched my video on the Heston tornado in 1990, you'll remember how a stray outflow boundary can intensify an outbreak. In this case, the outflow boundary was positioned to interact with any supercells that would move across the area in the next four hours. At around 6 p.m., discrete supercells started firing across the Mississippi and Alabama border. Many of these storms started off as HP or high precipitation supercells, quickly developing large hail cores. One of these supercells in particular formed along the line in the Tom Bigme Dash forest moving northeast and intensifying. At 6.53 p.m., the National Weather Service issued a PDS tornado watch for northern Alabama and western Georgia. At 7.01 p.m., the supercell dropped its first tornado just to the southeast of Gordo. The tornado stayed in a mainly rural area in western Tuscaloosa County, but did cause F3 damage to a few mobile homes. While the circulation remained relatively tight, the tornado lifted after 17 miles. At this point, the supercell was cycling. Supercells are somewhat delicate things. The thermodynamic processes that cause a tornado to drop and continue existing have to be in balance. It's akin to spinning a hula hoop very fast around your wrist. You can get it to go really fast, but at some point it'll slow down and fall, and you have to slow down to get the motion going again. At 7.30 p.m. in eastern Tuscaloosa County, a new circulation was forming on the southern side of the storm, and another tornado was about to drop. James Spann, chief meteorologist at ABC 3340, was on air urging people in Birmingham County to seek shelter from the imminent danger that lay a few miles ahead. At 7.42 p.m., the second tornado touched down around eight miles north of Brookwood in Tuscaloosa County. It was relatively weak for the first 10 miles of its life as it crossed into Jefferson County, but remember that fine line on the radar that we talked about a few minutes ago? That straight outflow boundary caused by the storms that hit earlier in southern Alabama? That boundary collided with the supercell right as it was crossing into Jefferson County, moving into a more populated area. Immediately after, the tornado widened immensely, becoming an F3 and heading straight for the community of Oak Grove. At the Oak Grove School, Vicki Higgins, an eighth grader at the time, was in the gym with the cheerleading squad for practice. The tornado slammed into the school, tearing off the roof of the gym and toppling the exterior walls of the classrooms. Vicky and her classmates dove into the gym lobby and huddled on the floor, which was spared due to the steel support beams bending perfectly over the lobby, shielding them from the debris. The rest of the gym was filled with bricks, glass, lockers, and debris three feet deep in some spots. Vicky and her classmates miraculously survived, but unfortunately three other people in Oak Grove were killed. Moving northeast, continuing to grow in size and intensity, the now F5 tornado barreled through the community of Rock Creek. Matthew Seals was living along Warrior River Road and was lofted into the tornado, knocked unconscious, and miraculously survived. Unfortunately, 11 people in that community were killed, including Matthew's son. Just to the east of Rock Creek are two overhead power transmission lines that supply electricity from the James H. Miller power plant located about 11 miles to the north. The tornado crossed directly over these transmission lines, causing a power surge and knocking the power out to the west side of Birmingham. James Spann was showing the ABC 3340 tower cam live on air just at the right time, capturing the moment it happened. You won't see much unless lightning illuminates the storm, and as it approaches that site, uh, yeah, we had a power failure. Did you guys see that? Uh, look at the lights down there go off. That, that looks like a massive power failure over the uh, western section of Birmingham. Luckily, it's a common practice for local radio stations to take the audio from live television stations during a weather event so that the people who have their power knocked out can still get severe weather coverage. To the east, the tornado hit the communities of Edgewater and McDonald Chapel at F4 intensity. 71 people were gathered at the Open Door Baptist Church along Route 269 in McDonald Chapel when the tornado hit. Miraculously, all of them survived. 
However, 18 additional people sheltered in their homes were killed. At this point, there was serious concern that the tornado would hit downtown Birmingham. It was about seven miles to the west and tracking to the east-northeast. But upon approach, the tornado began to weaken. It moved into Pratt City, causing substantial F3 damage to many homes, but luckily it didn't take any lives. Then, a mere two miles away from Birmingham Airport, the tornado lifted. It was on the ground for 31 miles, killed 32, injured 259, and caused $200 million in damage. It destroyed 1,100 homes, 15 churches, 20 apartments, and 4,000 acres of forest. This supercell went on to produce several more F2 tornadoes, one of them being a high-end F2 all the way in Dunwoody, Georgia, a northern suburb of Atlanta. Having occurred late in the evening in complete darkness in such a populated area, and considering that it destroyed hundreds of homes, it's a miracle that there was only one fatality. This tornadic event is interesting in that there are several papers that were published that evaluate the associated fatalities and the potential risk factors. In a report written by Yuichi Ono of Kent State University, we see that of the 32 fatalities, 13 were male and 21 were female. Of the 21 females, 5 were in mobile homes, 16 were in framed houses, and of those 16, 9 were in basements with windows. 5 deaths were in part caused by physical, mental, and social handicaps such as hearing loss and Alzheimer's. By far the most interesting data of this study came from evaluating the vehicles of the victims. While some sheltered in their basements, others were stuck inside their mobile homes. One of these mobile homes had its power cut by the electric company because the owners, who were parents, could not afford to pay the bill due to their child's medical expenses. Thus, if they had power or a battery-operated weather radio, this tragedy likely could have been avoided. However, they, along with 16 other victims, had a vehicle within the area surrounding their house. These 17 vehicles surrounding nine different sites where fatalities occurred were evaluated to see if any passenger within that vehicle would be likely to survive the tornado. And of those 17 vehicles, only three received major damage, meaning that it's possible if these people were outside of their homes and instead in their vehicles, they might have survived. I cannot stress this enough. You do not want to be in a vehicle during a tornado. If you need proof, just take a look down the street at the Open Door Baptist Church. The 71 churchgoers survived within the building, but most of their cars, which were located in a parking lot just to the side, were actually tossed into a ravine like toys. Your best bet is always to avoid the situation altogether by just being weather aware. But for these particular people, in this particular circumstance where that wasn't really an option, it might have been best if they were inside their cars. In a quick response report on the warning, response, and risk behavior of the tornado written by Dr. David Legates and Matthew Biddle, it was found that television was the primary warning source, meaning that 85% of the survivors affected by the tornado received the tornado warning via television, and 85% were also aware of the tornado watch. This gave half of the survivors greater than 10 minutes of lead time. The power outage ended up not being a huge deal because by the time the tornado actually hit those transmission lines, it was about halfway through through its cycle, many people in western Birmingham already knew the tornado was coming by then. There was quite a disparity in terms of how certain organizations handled the tornado warning as well. As we just discussed, the Open Door Baptist Church continued with their gathering even though they knew about the tornado warning. Now, it's possible they didn't want to send their parishioners home because they were worried that they might get hit by the tornado on their way home, but they chose to stay. However, the Bethel Baptist Church down the road in Moody decided to cancel their Easter pageant practice after hearing about the tornado in Birmingham. And just one hour later, that church was destroyed. The Birmingham Barons, which is the AAA baseball team, was in the middle of a game against the Carolina Mudcats. It was reported that the siren was ignored, the debris just falling out of the sky from the tornado that was about 16 miles away at that point was ignored, and ultimately they decided to cancel the game because the wind and the rain from the gust front was just too much. This is still a problem that exists today, and really I think it's just a ticking time bomb. One of these days a tornado is going to hit a large gathering of people who didn't take action, and it would have been completely avoidable. It really feels like after April 27th, everything that happened beforehand didn't really matter. April 27th was like taking the worst part of every violent lawn track tornado in Alabama state history and combining them into one day. 
Pratt City was destroyed by the tail ends of both the 1998 and 2011 tornadoes, and Tuscaloosa saw another violent tornado just two years later in 2000. All this to say that there are lessons to take from every tornado, and with April 27th being 11 years ago now, we're due for another tornado hitting a Dixie Alley city. We have to remain weather aware and have a plan in place for when the inevitable happens. If you guys enjoyed this video, if you guys like learning about severe weather in general, definitely like, subscribe, and comment. It really helps me out. And I hope you guys have a fantastic Thanksgiving. I will see you soon.